make a covenant with each other, but you know, uh, uh, there's a whole game or a whole set of rules when it comes to the Christian family than it does to the non-Christian. How many of you know that? And the major difference is this. When we made Jesus Lord of our life, we made a commitment to live by his word. Let me say that one more time. When we made Jesus the Lord of our life, in essence what we were doing, we was making a commitment to live by the Bible. And I can tell you right now, there's a bunch of Christians who do not live by the Bible. They have many times, you find in some cases, there are Christians who have picked out a selected part of the Bible. You say, what part is that selected part? The part they like. Amen. I'm talking good already, ain't I? Yeah, that's right. And so as a pastor, I'm coming to be able uh, to understand that a little more, that everybody ain't really practicing the word. And to many, they have various reasons why they are not practicing the word. Well, whatever your reason or excuse may be, that's up to you and that's between you and God. That's not my business. The bottom line is this. God sent his word to his family called the church. And because we are members of the blood-bought church, we also have come to a place that we respect that what he says, like it or not, is final authority. Can I say that one more time? What he said, <laughs> what he says, like it or not. And I'm telling you now, as, as a pastor and a Christian and a believer, there's a lot of things in the word you don't like it. You don't like it. It challenges your comfort zone. It challenges your ego. Whatever pride you have left after you get saved, it challenges that. So, you know, but we, we made up our mind that we want to do the will of God because we believe God's will has our best interests at heart. What I say, God's will has our best interests at heart. That means sometimes God says things and we don't like it, but behind it, his will is bringing to pass something better for you if you'll follow it. Are you listening to me? And so I wanted to put emphasis on those things before I began teaching this lesson tonight because what I'm still dealing with, because I did not even get halfway finished with it, is growing in harmony uh, with your spouse or how you find agreement with each other. Amen. How do you find this lock necked monster that is elusive called agreement? Uh, we, know we, should, we know we should agree, but how do you do it? That's the problem. Amen. And I want to tell you something. It ain't no just isolated problem. This problem is a real problem, and it challenges all of us. Amen. But I think if we let the word of God be fine authority as we said it is, this should not be as difficult as it is, uh, to, as it challenges us to be so many times. If you would, open up your Bible this evening with me to the book of Psalms 68. Psalm 68. And uh, once again, we have dedicated these midweek services to the Christian family, to the Christian family. And I have to say that again, because we can't speak into families that are non-Christian, because here's why, the word of God governed us as Christians. See, somewhere we have to have a, a media that brings us to respect what's final authority. Or you can argue with somebody all day about their position about, oh, I'm right, you right. I believe this, you believe that, you know, just like, uh, I, you know, I have uh, Muslim friends, but I also have encountered Muslims who was not my friend. And uh, we got into some heated debated debations and discussions about the Bible and about Jesus. And then I found myself going on and on into something. I said, wait a minute here. Hold it. Uh, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? No, I don't. That's what he said. And he, he being real. He didn't. He believed the Quran is God's word. Amen. And so then I said, we have no grounds for discussion then. 
because I believe the Bible is God's word, and you believe that the book you are uh, reverence and respect is God's word. So there's no agreement, first of all, what's the Bible or what's the Quran, who was God talking to what? You got it? So you know, can you see how long that argument could go on? Huh? Uh, the, well, now that says something. You know, a husband or a wife or a family, you know, and you professing to be Christians. Okay, we can argue all day long, but then at some point, what does the word say? Once we discover what the word say, that stops all argument. Unless you, unless you got some challenge, mental challenges. Because how are you going to argue with God? God says one thing and you're going to fuss about another thing. That ain't going to work. How many of you know that? Well, I want to make it very clear. I believe the Bible is God's word. Now, you think I'm just saying something. You don't know how critical that is in this hour now. There's a whole lot of folks got a Bible, but they don't believe it. You follow me? And there's a whole lot of folks believe this and that about the word. But I believe the Bible is God speaking to us. Let me go a step further. Huh? I believe the Bible, I'm going to talk out of it in a minute here. And when I talk from it, I believe that's God talking to us. Can I get a witness here? Amen. Praise God. Now, your life take on a whole nother meaning. When, now, I can tell you this now, that word, when, when it's God talking, it'll challenge sometimes your position. I was believing a lot of things before I became a Christian. Are you listening to me? And I started having to, I, you know, some, you know for, for a minute, you started trying to get the Bible to line up with you. Then you discover God don't line up with you. Then you start lining up with the Bible, and then your life, start, he start making the crooked places straight. And the rough places start getting smoothed on it. Because why? You have now taken the position to say, God, your word is right. You don't just have knowledge. You are all knowing. Come on, talk to me. Hallelujah. Before I had a brain, you had all knowledge. Amen. So then it, it behooves us to make adjustments that lines up with the word of God. Amen. Praise God. So I want to talk to you about this tonight, growing uh, in harmony where we can uh, find agreement, where we can find agreement with each other. Praise God. All right. Psalm 68, verses 5. I'm reading from the New King James, which is a good translation. Verses 5 and 6. It said, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He bring out those who are bound into prosperity. This is the word. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Now, whether we like it or not, God knew what a family meant and the function of it before we were born. Talk to me. He also knew what a husband was <laughs> before we understood it. Talk to me. And a wife. He also decided without my permission, I don't know did he, if he got yours, but he didn't get mine, to define the role of a husband and the role of a wife before you got married. They, <laughs> he didn't wait till you get married to then say, now here's the rules to this. No, he already had it in place, didn't he? Huh? Husband was in the Bible before I became a Christian. Talk to me. So he had it in place. Now, the, the, the thing of it is, then, I may think I know what it is to be a husband. You may think you know what it is to be a wife. But the bottom line is God knows what it is to be either one of them and give the role to what make it work, listen to me, and what, what calls it not to work. Huh? You know, there are a whole lot of things you, you, that you can just do that's wrong, and it ain't going to work. So we shouldn't even get married until we learn some right and wrong about it. Talk to me now. Uh, uh, as they say, some do's and don'ts. 
Along with that, then you're going to have a nasty devil that's fighting at you all the time. Huh? Without any permission, he just going to show up. So you already got him to contend with, along with ignorance and what you're doing. Is it a wonder why marriages are not working? Give me some help in here. Then if you ask most husbands, most men or wives, what does the word say about this or that? Most of them can't even give you an answer. Not scripturally, they can't. They'll tell you what their grandma said about it. And sometimes that wasn't right. I know what you say, don't talk about my grandma. Well, I'll talk about mine then. <laughs> Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Over here we find two is better than one. What the words say, two is better than one. So my insight out of this, and of course I just read to you, God set the solitary in family. Basically what I'm trying to tell you is God set the structure for a family, especially, listen to me, the Christian family. You know, so I'm, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on that as long as we do these midweek lessons because I think a lot of folks think you're just talking about family in generality, so that means anybody, anything, everything go. No, no, no. The Christian family is where we get now instructions from the word from. You got it? The Bible. Because we have a different set of rules to abide by than the non-Christian. Amen? Huh? Just like a, 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 you have something to abide by different than a person who ain't saved. Huh? They, they, they say, I'm going to act like this. Well, you can't act like them because they're acting like this. Because they ain't, they ain't saved. So they ain't got to be, they don't have the same accountability that you have. Do they? No, because Hebrews 11 said it this way in verse 6. It said, he that come to God. First, you got to come. And after you come, you must. That word means imperative of necessity. You can't get around it. You, you know, if he wouldn't have said must, then that means you have a choice. But after you come, God takes your choice from you. You lose your right to be right. <laughs> Anybody besides me done lost your right to be right before God? Huh? I'm right. You ain't no sense trying to be right before God. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Amen. Amen. I've made a decision to follow Jesus. What about you? I'm not in here, but one person said yes in here. Anybody else going to talk to pastor? I don't think I want to go any further because I thought I was talking to Christians. Huh? You made a decision to follow Jesus. Yeah. All right, talk to me then. Amen. <laughs> All right. So then if that be so, then the structure was set in place. Now, what will be wisdom is this. See, wisdom is simply this. Whatever God say, do it. That's wisdom. And wisdom is what the Bible said in Proverbs. And I, I think Solomon ought to know he had more wives than anybody I ever heard of. Man have 1,000 wives and, you know, how many? 700 wives and 300 concubines. He know what to say about a wife. Talk to me. You know what he said? Through, uh, through wisdom, a house is built. So he said you can't build a house without wisdom. He ain't talking about just a uh, foundation, the structure. He talking about if you're going to build a family, you got to have some wisdom to do it. I believe you got to have some wisdom to be married successful. I believe that. Amen. Then he said, through knowledge is the chambers filled with all precious metal, uh, all precious things. Huh? So you need wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The foundation is established. All three, you need that. You need wisdom, you need some knowledge, and you need some understanding. I think they need to make at least getting married as hard as the set of, getting a set of driver license. What do you say? 
they at least make need, they at least need to make it that hard. Talk to me. You gotta go through something to get a set of license. They ain't gonna have, you can't drive legally without them. Talk to me. And they make sure you not only know some, some road driving, they want to see do you know what signs mean, what they're trying to tell you. We ain't going to let you out here just kill us any kind of way down. <laughs> so the same is true. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> huh? I'm glad about it, too. Huh? That first time I went to jail, I went to jail for driving without no license. <laughs> yes, I did. First time they took me downtown. I was down there driving out. You, you know, really, he thought I was a little boy. Come on now. That's the way he's driving a car. <laughs> I, was, I was much older than what I look. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That blessing been on me a long time. I got, I got, I, man, that police stopped me and said, wait a minute, what you doing driving? <laughs> he gave it out of town. Amen. All right. You got e e Ecclesiastes 4. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 4. We'll pick up at verse 9 from that particular book. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9. This, these are things that are necessary if we're going to have a, a Christian marriage that, that will be successful. And of course, uh, the, the devil have set his uh, plan against the Christian family that we won't make it. Amen? And of course, sometimes it ain't just the devil, it's just that. What, what, the, what the Lord say over here? The, the rebellious. Then he see it. So you can't blame it all on the devil, can you? Well, one of, what is one of the, 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 the defining words we could use, what rebellious means, is unwilling to make any change. Uh, you, you, you set to do it your way. Now, you got people like that, don't you? In the church. Talk to me now. In the church. All right, verse 9, but that ain't us. <laughs> that ain't us. That's them. It said two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. What's your translation say right there where it say, huh? His fellow. But I think companion is real good because that's what we're supposed to become uh, in a marriage covenant. We're supposed to become companions, don't we? Now, what are, what are one of the essential things that we want as companions in a marriage covenant? I'll tell you what they are. We want love, we want harmony, and we want agreement. Huh? We want, you want love in your companionship. You want harmony there. Because if you don't have harmony, you won't have peace. Talk to me. Huh? You will not have peace. <laughs> so... That, wonder why, can't you see why God take the time to tell us some things about even the selecting of husbands and wives and how you should do it, how you shouldn't do it. You know, it's like one of the things, say, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So he says to me and you, whether we like it or not, that a believer shouldn't even be looking at an unbeliever not considering them to be your lifetime companion. You say, why? Because there will be no harmony there. You will have to beg for peace. You won't have any. You interceding just for nothing but peace. Lord, give me peace so I can sleep tonight. Now, I know, and I've seen it, you, you, you know, in some cases, people change, but you don't want to. You don't want to play Vegas with your life. You know, don't you don't want to be believing they're gonna change down the road? Cause usually they won't. After they you done made a commitment to them, they ain't gotta change. There's more. You have more leverage to get change before, don't you? And you better use your leverage then. <laughs> You better use your leverage, huh? I ain't got to change now. Why? I got all the Kool-Aid I want. Uh, 
<laughs> Hold it out to them, but don't give it to them. Why? You ain't saved yet. You get saved, you get all the Kool-Aid. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, it, it, it is difficult with two people who know God to make a successful marriage. It's challenging. How much more is going to be with a person don't know God and a person do know God under the same roof? Now, here's what the problem is, and this is what some people don't believe it, but that's your problem. A man or a woman, either. One has the spirit of God in them and the other has not made Jesus Lord of life. You got two spirits under the same roof. Like it or not. One is called light and the other is called darkness. You, you see, you ain't gonna get them to say that, that you ain't gonna get them to say Satan is my father. <laughs> Come on, I was full of the devil, and you couldn't tell me I was under the devil's power. And you either, huh? You didn't make that confession. No, 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 no. I know God, full of the devil. Because there ain't nothing nobody wants to say. But Jesus said to a group of people, you are of your father, the devil. So whether we like it or not, Satan father people. Those who have not made Jesus the Lord of their life. They ain't talking about joining the church and getting baptized. There are a lot of people who do all those extra things, but they don't know Christ. Covenant people have no business coming in covenant with people who don't have made a covenant with God. They're talking about two is better than one. See what happened. When you make a commitment to a person, the two of you become one. Now, if I make a commitment to a person that don't know Christ or that person make a commitment to me that don't know Christ and I don't know Christ, then if they do know him, already there's hostility going to break out. Just a matter of time. Light and darkness can't commingle. No more than oil and water. The, the components in oil won't make it mix with water. It'll float on water, but it won't break down in water. Talk to me. And when Jesus, <laughs> see, I'm dealing with something here. And when Jesus is on the inside of you and darkness is working on somebody else, there's already a war going on. Without words. There's a war going on. Talk to me. Praise God. That's why the Lord said, you know, uh, in some cases, he'll say, if you ain't willing to give up everything to follow me, you can't be my, my servant. You can't be my follower. Sometimes he'll make you give up a boyfriend that you think you can't live without, a girlfriend. Talk to me that you can't think you can't live without a position, a career. He, not in every case, but sometimes he will ask you to give it up for him. Huh? And he said, if you're not, he said, if you put your mother or father over me, you're not worthy of me. See, we don't like to hear that kind of stuff about the Lord in the Bible, because that's strong. But see, that's what I was talking about. Some cases, talk to me. There are some pools and ties that family members have on each other that are ungodly. And a person can't even serve God for a family member. Are you listening to me? And the Lord will make you pick sometime. Now, if you give it up for him, he'll turn around and work it out for you. Get them straight. But if you put them in front of him, anything and everything you put in front of the Lord turns into a mess right before your eyes. Talk to me. Huh? You get spouses. Sometimes they, they, they don't want to live for God, and you, you're committed to keep living for God. Sometimes a division will come right there. Remember, a husband is not your Lord, or a wife ain't either. Jesus is. Talk to me. There's a place you have to say, look, I follow you, but I, God is my Lord. And I'm not going to follow you to hell. I love you, but I ain't going to follow you to hell. 
talk to me. Huh? You know, some people say, I love, love people so much, I say, I'll follow you to hell. I don't love you like that. I don't love you while I'm going to follow you to hell because he delivered me from hell. Talk to me. Do this still sound like a Christian family that I'm teaching on to y'all? <laughs> I'm trying to show you, I'm trying to show you in many cases why a lot of things don't work for a lot of believers in relationship because there are not a whole lot of people really committed to live in the word. They have their parts they like, and they have their parts they don't want to even pay attention to. But the Bible is God speaking to us. And you don't have no favorite parts that you put over the word. The word is the word. And the Bible says forever, O oh Lord, your word is what? Settle in heaven. How long? Forever. So some suffering we may be doing because we ain't even in the word. We ain't scripturally sound in our position. All right? Did you get that? Two is better than one. Now let's look at some things about this uh, how we get some uh, agreement because I think the Lord really gave me some insight on this and I think a lot of families including mine all is challenged with areas where you know you should have greater agreement and you have to fight for agreement you have to stand for agreement come on talk to me God's best it comes out of, of agreement when they say two is better than one, it means when two people come together and make a covenant, they're supposed to be better now than when they were single. Amen. That's the Bible. Let's look at Matthews 18 and 19 once again. The Bible tells us over there, if two of you will agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. Who is going to be done for them. So this work for them. It don't work for him or her by itself. This power of agreement is for two of us. Amen. But I love it because the devil don't want us to discover the hidden power, the hidden provision, the hidden blessings that's in this thing called agreement. Amen. But it's in the word. And if, the, and if Jesus didn't mean it, he wouldn't have put it in here. Amen that there are some things that a man and a woman can come together and agree on and nothing can stop you from uh, not receiving. Which tell me then, if this is true, no husband and wife should be a failure. Amen. Because it don't matter what we lack, all we got to do is agree and God will bring the provision of anything we lack, whether it's naturally, spiritually, or <laughs> it don't matter what arena is in, we can get what we need based upon the scripture, can't we? How many of you love that the word is a supplier of needs? There are needs we have as human beings. God have designed that the word will meet it. Talk to me. Matter of fact, it will meet it in ways that nothing else can. Needs that all humans have. You know, there's only five basic needs all human beings have, no matter what color, creed, or race we come from. There are five basic needs all humans have. Common to man. Isn't that right? One of them, first and foremost, is we all need love. Huh? What the world need now? <laughs> no, we, see, you don't have to know God, but you want somebody to love you. Why? That's a need inside of you. Here's another one. We all need someone to worship. If you're alive, you, now these atheists are talking about, I don't believe in anything. You have to believe that you don't believe in nothing to believe that. See, you can't be alive and don't exercise belief. So I don't believe in nothing. Well, you don't believe in nothing, but you believe in that. So ain't no such thing as a person say that, that, that I don't believe uh, in anything. You have to believe you don't believe in anything. You following me? 
Why? Because God built inside of every human to believe. We all have a need to be needed. We all do. Huh? Now we can get angry and crazy and say something. I don't need nobody. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, you need a Tylenol right now while you're saying it or something, but you need, you need to be needed. That's one of the most popular. That's one of the most heart-wrenching things I think a husband or wife can ever hear from their spouse. When one of them tells you, I don't need you no more. That, 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 that breaks the heart and the spirit. It does. And unfortunately, you wake up, people wake up, and they wake up some, some, some side of the bed, and that be on them. I don't need you no more. I taught that years ago. Some of you remember that when we were talking about that. Amen. Hallelujah. Lift your hand and give the Lord a praise. I done gave you a lot of data in here tonight. Yes, Lord. So Jesus said, if two of you will agree on earth, that's touching what? How many things? So what that leave out? Can't you see now why the devil don't want no agreement among the husband or wife? Because you can get anything from this right here present. So then that lets you know you're going to have a lot of roadblocks and hindrance when it comes to being able to work this principle. Because really it's a master key for family life. Uh, it is a master key to take a family from one place in life to another place. Talk to me. All you need is agreement. Huh? That's all you need. Huh? You may lack this, you may lack that. Just agree with us. That's all we need. And God said, I'll get involved if you can agree. <laughs> As touching anything, whatever y'all need, God will give it to you by agreement. Praise God. Whatever it is. Without any boundaries. Lord, we need more money in our family. All right, agree on it then. And let me create the way for it to happen. Lord, we need more of this. Lord, we need that. Whatever it is. Now, it may don't happen overnight. He didn't say that. He said, but if you set yourself to agree, then Jesus said, the Father will do it. Now, you know, it's po it's, that's, that's powerful. Because here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. The father who can't lie will make it happen for you if you just agree. Jesus would never lie on the father. He would never say that if the father wouldn't do it. It'll be done for them. He didn't say he'll do it. He said it'll be done for them of my father which is in heaven. Agreement causes the father of all creation to go into action on behalf of where he find it at. And what's amazing is it ain't got to be a husband and wife, a son and a daughter. Come on, talk to me. Can, can agree with a mother. Talk to me now. You can agree with anybody, just wherever you find agreement. But I'm saying how much more you should have it between a husband and a wife. Why we can't agree when we both say we love God? I'm talking to the Christian family. I'm not talking to people who don't know God. They don't have the same game of rules to play by. Me and you have a different set. Why we can't agree? Because when we say Jesus is Lord, what did we say? What did we say? We said something. You ain't saved if you didn't say it. <laughs> and if you said it, something happened, didn't it? I know when I say, Lord Jesus, man, I'm telling you, the power of God came upon me. Talk to me. Lord, help me. The Holy Spirit went to work. 
I knew I wasn't part of no, no religious set there. I knew I had, matter of fact, I had a guy trying to argue with me, talking about you ain't saved unless you get baptized in the name. Uh -huh. And I hadn't been saved that long, so he almost had me about to say some things I had no been to say, telling me I wasn't saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Telling me I wasn't saved. I was ready to go to work on him, man. Because I know I'm saved. Passionate about it. But when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, here's what took place. When you said that Romans 10, 8, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tell us if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Verse 11 says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you listening to me? Now, then when we, when we, when we did that, we actually forfeit the right to our own choices and decisions in the sense that we gave ourselves over to him. We did. Huh? <laughs> when you made him Lord, you said, Lord, you're, you're master over my life. That's what you was doing. That's what you said. You're the master. I'm, see, before I made him Lord, I was the master of my own life. Huh? One of my favorite songs, It's My Thing. I want my favorite song. I do what I want to do. Nobody tell me. See, y'all folks ain't saved saying all that kind of stuff. No, really. Really. When I, when I made that commitment to Jesus and began to realize what I had said, talk to me. The weight of it began to work on me. I knew I had more than a religion. I knew that I had an encounter with a living God. What kind of God? Every other God they talk about is dead. But this one was alive. And he made himself known to me. Talk to me. He made himself known to me without me knowing a verse in the Bible. Hallelujah. I ain't no verse to go find this and that. He made himself known to me. Huh? I'm Lord of your life. That's what you, that's why the change, I, my, the, that's why the change was so dramatic. People didn't even believe it. They couldn't believe it. Wait a minute, I just saw, I saw you last month. <laughs> Are you talking about God the way you do it? What happened? Jesus is Lord in my life. I'm saved. And no problem telling nobody that. I'm saved. You what? I'm saved. Jesus is Lord of my life. That means I lost the right to make final choices and decisions. That's what I did. That means I was making, in essence, I was saying, I'm going to live by this word here now, no matter how difficult it is. Don't mean you do everything right, because we don't do it. But we strive to please the Lord. So there's some things I just ain't going to do it. I don't care what nobody's saying. I ain't doing it. Why? Because Jesus is Lord of my life. Now then, if that be so, then there's some things when it comes to marriage and a husband and a wife that it don't matter what I feel about it. I got to back up and say, wait a minute here. How, this is how I feel, but this is what I know the words say. So then now, what I feel don't carry the weight no more. Why? Because Jesus is what? Now, see, we're going somewhere here now. You see, if that be what's working in the families of the Christian families, a lot of this hell will stop. But you got people who are selective about what they believe in the Bible. 
That's the part they like. But God don't deal with your likes and dislikes. He tell you what his, his will is. And then he reveals his will to you. And if they obey and serve him, they'll spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. That means I don't care what we feel about it or think about it. I know God's revealed will, but I keep choosing not to do it as a husband, not to do it as a wife. There ain't no cure for that other than dry land. You're going you're gonna to live in a dry area in your relationship. Talk to me. And it's not a philosopher. It's not a psychologist. It's not theory that's going to fix you. Is when you line your will up to do what you don't want to do. That's what changes. This is this good stuff here. Come on. This is this, this, this is what a rubber meet the road at. Come on, talk to me. Amen. Praise God. This is where you grow up at. Because you got too many people that are married in infant stages. They like the idea of marriage, but they don't like the commitment to marriage. And it's a different thing. How many of you know that? The idea of it is one thing. The doing it is a, it's a different world than where you come from. <laughs> you better know it. Huh? Praise the Lord. This is what the Holy Spirit put in my heart tonight just to share with you. As Christian men and women, we have a different philosophy that we live by. And it's not my thing no more. It's not what somebody else feel about it or what I feel about it. It's what does the word say? When, when we go back to the word, we can get the God of the word to show up in our situations. You can't change people when they think they're right. Talk to me. I don't care what their name is. When they think they're right, you can't change them. Believe me what I'm telling you. You're wasting your time. Hmm? Praise God. So a whole lot of the problems that's in the relationship simply goes back to we got a manual to follow. How well are we willing to follow it? God gave us a manual on family. God gave us a manual on what a husband should do and what he shouldn't do. What a wife should do and what she shouldn't do. And if we're willing to follow the manual, we'll get the wisdom of God in our uh, relationships. And wisdom always promises success. It don't mean it's going to always come easy, but you'll win. You'll win. Praise the Lord. You've been blessed this evening. Let's give the Lord a good hand. Praise everybody. I want to invite you to stand. I want to invite you to stand. Hallelujah. Praise God. After I teach you this Sunday, I'm going to challenge you to go back to reading a chapter a day of the Bible. If you're not doing it, start doing it. The reward will be rich. The Holy Ghost told me to do it again. Say it again. Because there are things I want to get to people in this particular body, and I 